Hello, this is Manuel Bardiès. I'm from Institut de Recherche en Cancérologie de Montpellier in France. And I'm going to give you this uh, lecture on patient-specific dosimetry in nuclear medicine, which is the third of a series of five lectures that were designed uh, for the IAA Technical Cooperation Program uh, as a project, Paul 1925. Targeted radionuclide therapy, meaning therapeutic nuclear medicine, involves using high activity, and therefore we're going to induce deterministic effects. So in terms of dosimetry, what we want to document is the irradiation procedure the best we can with the highest possible accuracy. And this has possibly different objectives. The first one is to compare studies performed in different institutions or with different radiopharmaceuticals. The second is quite important is that it may be a legal requirement, as is the case of the European Union, according to the Euratom Directive from 2013. Then it's also documenting the therapeutic, the, uh, the therapeutic administration of radiopharmaceutical. And it's also to optimize, which is the rational behind the Euratom Directive 2013-57. The last reason or the last rational for uh, doing dosimetry in a context of therapy is that since some um, diseases are slowly evolving, it may be the case that a patient comes back and requires being irradiated or for, by external radiotherapy, for example, after having received a treatment of iodine-131 for thyroid cancer. In which case, I think the first thing the radiation oncologist in external beam radiotherapy will ask the nuclear medicine physician is, that patient benefited from a treatment some years ago, what's the absorbed dose that was delivered and where? And so documenting the dosimetry in that context is very important because it has to be kept for years. So all these reasons lead to the need for establishing uh, patient-specific dosimetry. So nuclear medicine dosimetry, as was already presented in the first lecture, is summing the contribution to a given target from the various sources. And according to the mode formalism that is given by the equation here, uh, states that you have first to get the accumulated activity, which is the total number of decay in a source, then that can be obtained by implementing quantitative imaging and time activity curve integration, which are two independent steps, and then uh, S values that absorb those calculation itself. So you can do that by yourself, or you can use already computed S values. And obviously the global accuracy requires on both terms. So if you're improving the accumulated activity, then you have to improve the accuracy on S and vice versa. So if we're starting from what was seen in the previous lecture for diagnostic dosimetry, where accumulated activity is obtained for a group, S values for reference model, and you end up with a model-based dosimetry, then um, that's explained why diagnostic dosimetry is essentially model-based. But going in direction of therapy, the first thing to do is to make sure that the pharmacokinetic is obtained for a given patient. So pharmacokinetic, quantitative imaging, and time activity fitting have to be obtained patient by patient. How that? Well, the cumulated activity is the integration of the time activity curve. So it means that we need to implement quantitative imaging being able to compute the activity present in the different tissues of a patient, so in space, all along the pharmacokinetics, so that's in time. And then once you have the time activity curve for every source of interest, then you have to be able to fit and integrate the time activity curve. So quantitative imaging is how to get the activity in the source H at the time T. The first question we have to ask is, is quantitative imaging for dosimetry different from conventional quantitative imaging in nuclear medicine? And fortunately, the quick answer is no, meaning that we can benefit from the knowledge of quantitative imaging for scintigraphic imaging, basically. 
And the fact is that we have more physicists skilled in quantitative imaging than in dosimetry. So that is going to be a tremendous help for us. But then some aspects are specific. For dosimetry, what we want is absolute quantification. We want to have activity concentration in all voxels that make the image. So we want to get Becquerel per cc. We want also that the corrections are fine for the whole field of view, because we consider that the contribution of every source to a given target can span over the whole body of a patient. In other words, and contrary to some imaging that can be done in nuclear medicine, we want to assess the quantitative content of the image all over the field of view, all over the patient. And we want that in time. So these are some references to the MERD pamphlets that have been in, uh, describing quantitative imaging. So what do we want? We want to sample the time activity curve. And obviously the temporal sampling is going to be very important. You can see here the variation of the activity as a function of time that is sampled by these six time points. And you can think that it's quite a good sampling of a time activity curve with six time point. Is it doable in clinical practice? Not necessarily. And obviously we have to pay attention to different aspects in the pharmacokinetics. The first one is that because we are in a context of therapy, we are using quite high activities that may induce dead time, especially in early time point. So we have to be able to, first of all, identify the possibility of dead time and then do the required collaborations just to make sure that we can correct for that time. Then on late images, late time point, we may suffer from a lack of statistics due to the decrease of activity. So these are the two um, opposite aspects that we want to affect, that we want to, to be able to address. But then temporal sampling by itself. As we can see here, we have six time points, but we may not have the possibility to image a patient six times we may have only three time points. And so it means, I mean, you can see here very clearly that we're going to uh, miss some part of the pharmacokinetics just by having uh, not enough time points to sample the curve. But it's not just a matter of how many time points, it's also where they are located in the pharmacokinetics. Because here you can see you have three time points, that here you also have three time points and you're going to miss another part of a pharmacokinetic, which is probably much more important because you're going to miss here the late part of a, so that's the elimination part of a pharmacokinetic. And this will have big consequences on the accumulated activity. You may sometimes be faced with extreme situations like that one that was communicated to me by an American colleague. So this is a treatment of um, a teenager with fiery cancer metastasis in the lungs, as you can see, diffuse metastasis. And the physician comes to the physicist and say, can you compute the absorbed dose? Because I want to treat that young person with uh, iodine 131 and I don't want to damage her lung function. And the problem is that this is to the right, the only thing we have to do our absorbed dose calculation with. So it's only one time point on 120 hours and it's not even calibrated. What we have is CPM, so count per minute. It's not even activity. So that's what I say, an extreme temporal sampling, extreme in the sense that uh, the absorbed dose calculation will be made by making so many assumptions that it's very difficult to make any, take any decision based on this uh, poor quality input data. Then another point interesting is that most of Im quantitative imaging performed for dosimetry at the moment is done using SPECT imaging and not PET. Even though PET has been proposed for a long time, but uh, now, and including for dosimetry, we see some example, but most PET traces are currently labeled with fluorine 18 that has a two hour half-life. So it means that most of the um, pharmacokinetics of the vectors that are being used for targeted radionuclide therapy about a much longer biological half-life. And that cannot be followed with a physical half-life so short as that as fluorine 18. So what has been proposed by some groups 
is to use pair of beta plus beta minus isotopes. The relevance for that is that it is, uh, the assumption is that quantitative imaging is more accurate with PET imaging due to, for example, the attenuation correction and other factors that can be corrected. So the idea would be to establish a pharmacokinetic of a vector using a PET isotope in order to get the pharmacokinetic and extrapolate that to derive the activity to inject of the SPECT or beta minus isotope for the therapy. So some pairs have been identified like iodine-124 for imaging before iodine-131 for therapy, yttrium 86 for yttrium 90 COBA-64 for COBA-67, etc. This is mostly a domain of research these days. The problem is that most PEST systems are not designed to cope with exotic radionuclides. And this is a very good example. This is the emission spectrum of fluorine 18. As you can see, it emits uh, beta plus 96.79%. So you can see that you've got mostly beta plus emissions. But if you look at iodine 124, you understand why this type of beta plus emitter is called a dirty isotope. Because if you look at the list here, there's only a very low amount of beta plus emitted per decay, and it is blurred in a, long, a large number of gamma emitted, some of which fall in the energetic window uh, around to, uh, 511 kV, meaning that you will have to, you'll have a lot of random coincidence and you have to do a lot of correction to be able to, to do your quantification correctly. Yet it has been proposed, and this is one of the first examples I can see uh, proposed by Zguros to follow in time, day zero, one, and two, differentiated thyroid cancer metastasis with iodine one to four. Another example, and we discuss that later in the next lecture, is that of yttrium 86 based dosimetry uh, that allowed some uh, colleagues to establish the absorbed dose effect relationship for tumors. But in real life, most of quantitative imaging is done uh, using SPECT acquisition. And as you know, it can be made using planar uh, scintigraphy, which I do not recommend because it's very difficult. I mean, it's so highly operator dependent, especially because you have to correct for background and superposition of activity in the patient that I highly recommend using tomographic uh, SPECT imaging or hybrid using you know 2d and the ct for example so this is an example here where the the ct is being used to define uh, functional volumes that are projected in 2d and then you end up with a linear combination that potentially can allow you to make an iterative uh, process to get the true activity distribution in 3d imaging um, this is an excellent paper and this is an excellent approach, but to be fully honest, at the price to pay in terms of uh, implementing that approach and that methodology is so high that I would probably recommend using straight 3D uh, if possible. This is another example of hybrid imaging where you have some specs on one stage, you know, one volume of the patient, and then the rest is uh, planar. Uh, whole the imaging because that is obviously needed. Another specific uh, discussion on iodine-131 imaging. Iodine-131 is not an excellent isotope for quantitative imaging in nuclear medicine. The reason is the high energy gamma emissions. Uh, we know the 364 kV main peak, but uh, there are two other peaks above that and so the scatter coming from these 637 and 723 kV emissions can pollute the uh, peak uh, spectrometric window that is centered on 364 kV. And the fact is that gamma cameras are not adapted to iodine-131 imaging, as can be seen here in that research uh, from Damien Autre and colleagues. This is a simulation of a point source of iodine-131 in air. So it's a very simple source indeed. Um, and that is a Monte Carlo modeling of that using two Monte Carlo codes, MCNP and GATE. 
And so what you have to the top left is a 20% photo, uh, photo peak window, photo uh, energetic window. So 20% centered on the photo peak. And you can see the very nice uh, star-shaped artifact that is uh, specific to iodine 131 and coming from septal penetration. Uh, but since this is model imaging, so you know the history of each photon that is uh, scored in the 20% window. And so by further pushing the analysis, it was possible to see that over 100 photon detected in the 20% window from point sources, then we have about 30 photons, 30% 30 that are scattered photons. So scattered where? There's no patient, it's just a point source in air. So it's scattered photons in the collimator that are yet detected in the 20%. So these are scattered photons that are detected in the 20% energy window. Then you have 22, 23%. That are photons that underwent a septal penetration, so they pass through the collimator septa without and being uh, without interaction, and yet they are fully detected in the crystal, and so they participate to the twenty percent energy window. And the conclusion is that of a hundred photon in the twenty percent energy window, only half of that, 47, 46 percent, are actually geometric photons, so photons that have crossed the whole of a collimator without being detected and then are detected by the crystal. So obviously you understand why quantitative imaging can be very difficult in that, in that context if only one of the two photons is of a good photon. Uh, and that leads to calibration. So very quickly, there are two schools for calibration. The first school says, give me a point source in air and I'll manage the rest. So this is how it's been acquired, a point source in air and then your gamma camera doing the reconstruction process and during all the attenuation correction, scatter correction, uh, and all the um, uh, PSF correction, everything can be implemented by the machine. The other approach, which is quite spread, is to say humbly, I'm not 100% sure that my gamma camera is going to correct everything the way I'd like to. So I'm going to base my calibration on a phantom that looks like my, my patient. So I'll try to have a geometry that is quite similar to the geometry of a patient. So these are the fun, some of the phantoms that can be used. You've got one here that is quite famous. You've got another one here where the organs are quite realistic. You've got here a liver and uh, that is hiding the kidneys and the spleen. And this is how calibration can be made in, in a clinical context. Obviously, quantitative imaging is probably the hardest part of, uh, of the clinical dosimetry process. It's probably the part where the highest uncertainties can be found. Um, and that, but we'll discuss that later in next lecture or the last lecture actually. Um, that is where a lot of evolution took place. Uh, I'm saying that now, and I'm going to say again in another lecture that in good old time, it was so difficult to compute as values that we were living gladly with uncertainties associated with quantitative imaging. The fact is that now we are able to compute the absorbed dose with a very good level of accuracy, meaning that a lot of pressure is now on the quantitative imaging part of a clinical dosimetry workflow. So assessing the errors is the main issues. There's a lot of methodologies in the literature uh, the problem is how to implement that and how to spread it. How disseminable are they? Because somehow many of these approaches are a single center or a single lab approach. And in a world with a growing number of multicentric studies, it is tremendously important not only to have the best available methodology, but it's also the best available methodology that can be implemented in the different clinical departments. Otherwise, uh, it's very difficult. So this is what is presented in my pamphlet 33. With here some simulated images in different conditions of indium imaging, lutetium, yttrium 90 with spec uh, with um, Remschlagung imaging, iodine 131, that with simple cor correction like attenuation, then scatter, and then uh, PSF 
correction and you can see the improvement even if a photo of scan is not of a very good quality but uh, you can see the improvement from raw reconstructed images to corrected images and you can understand that the level of quantification and of accuracy is increasing uh, these are some examples from the MERT pamphlet 23 of experiments that have been reported with different radionuclide systems and reconstructions uh, when the accuracy could be assessed and you can see that what is aimed for is something like you know less than 10 percent i think is starting to to be good in terms of quantification uh then if you can get more less than you know better than five percent i would say that you're quite lucky and that's excellent results for this standardization is the key so because this is an iaea project i really want to mention that uh crp so it's a collaborative research project that was ended some years ago and which consists in comparing the accuracy that could be obtained using different quantification approaches for iodine 131 so that was the same phantom that was circulated in different centers and the different centers were able to do different quantification approaches and was using quanti conjugate views of planar imaging with or without attenuation correction the inspect with just the chunk basic attenuation correction or spec ct and the, the conclusion of this study is is not just about the accuracy so it's not just about how close to one you can be it's how spread your results are you can see here you've got one example with a uh, chunk for example um, that the average result is very close to one but then the spread between centers or between sources can be so high that is very difficult to to consider the the uncertainties in in, in that approach so in fact there's only spec city that is providing not only good results in terms of accuracy but also uh, the variability of the results obtained Uh, another study that I'd like to mention is that by Steffi Peters in Netherlands that grouped different centers all over Netherlands and tried to get the recovery coefficient. So that's you know, a way to compensate partial volume effect using a famous uh, JASIC phantom with uh, hollow spheres of variable volumes. And so that's how you get that reconstruction uh, done and you got your core, your recovery curve that's being used to correct partial volume effect. And the take home message of that study was that absolute spec quantification was possible in a multi-center and multi-vendor spec CT environment. So that's a very good and very promising news because it means that no matter which camera you have, uh, you can connect to a multi-centric trial. So as a conclusion uh, for therapy, the first thing to do is quantitative imaging. And I think that's by far the most demanding task. Then it is possible to adjust the model, uh, a reference model to the geometry of your patient. That is what I call model adjusted as value determination. So that's an example here because for well, for electrons, for beta, it's a very, very a simple way to adjust S values from a model to a patient by just making the mass ratio of the organ of interest between the patient, that's the organ of interest between the patient and the model. And that works for beta radiation and electrons only, even though for self-absorbed dose, and again, this is only for self-absorbed dose, there is also a way to correct for the gamma uh for a variable uh mass but it's not so simple it's not just uh, a trivial mass ratio um but for self-absorbed dose it is possible to adjust the s value based on a reference model to the geometry of your patient so it's very good and this was tested here in a study some years ago where based on the MERD mathematical model to the left uh, several patients, nine patients, were enrolled with variable weight and variable height. And then the lungs, the kidney, the liver, and the spleen were segmented, and absorbed dose calculation and S value calculations were done using Monte Carlo based on this specific geometry. So, this is a result obtained for iodine 131 
And this is the kidney to kidney, so self-absorbed dose or self-absorbed S value, kidney to kidney. And uh, what happens? You have nine patients here, and then uh, you have a standard S value. So if you consider that all the patients have got the same kidney, you end up with the same S value for all of them. Then if you compute the specific S value based on each patient geometry, you end up with an S value that is very different. All of all the S values computed from patient one to nine are very inferior to start with to the S value of uh, the standard human or the reference, but they're also viable by a factor that's superior to two to the standard S value. Then taking the standard S value and just correcting by the mass ratio between the standard kidney and the patient kidney gives a standard adjusted S value. And you can see that these values are very close to the specific values. In conclusion, it means that it doesn't really matter if you do not have very refined computation capabilities. As long as you have, as long as you're interested in the average absorbed dose at the organ level, and as long as you've got the standard S values, which are freely available, and if you have the volume of the organ you're interested in, and you usually have that with spec CT, with a CT component of spec CT, then you can do the mass ratio and you can do the very basic correction that falls within some percent with a real value. So by doing so, you have specific activity quantification adjust model as value determination. So you still have model-based dosimetry, but it's something it's model adjusted. It's something it's more realistic dosimetry. It is very close to patient-specific dosimetry, but it's not yet patient-specific fully. In fact, the only way to implement fully patient-specific dosimetry is to do every step in a specific way. Quantitative imaging, I'm not coming back on this, but also specific absorbed dose calculation in which you may not even compute the S value. The S value is meaningful when it's being used for different situations. But if you use it only for one patient, you're not going to compute S values. You're going to compute straight the absorbed dose to a patient. And that is what patient-specific dosimetry is. So basically for patient-specific absorbed dose calculation, you're going to use patient CT because it's going to give you voxel by voxel the density of the medium where radiation is uh, propagates. And then the specs to give you the activity or cumulated activity, again, if possible, voxel-based. And you're going to do the calculation using different algorithm. So which algorithm? Well, depending on the size of the object and radiation characteristic, so radiation range, if you have non-penetrating radiation, then there's no need to propagate it. You can just assume local energy deposition, LED. Then if you don't have non-penetrating radiation, then you have to implement some algorithm. And this depends on the medium you, the radiation is propagating in. If it's an homogeneous medium, then you can use convolution because you just need to know the absorbed dose at a distance of a point source in homogeneous medium, which is called the absorbed dose point kernel. And you can do that with convolution to your activity or cumulated activity to get a distribution of absorbed dose or absorbed dose rates. Then if no, then you're going to be led to implement Monte Carlo modeling. So Monte Carlo modeling should be restricted in a situation where you have penetrating radiation and heterogeneous medium. So voxel versus organ approaches. Well, we can compute at the moment using Monte Carlo because the computing power is growing and is now available in various environments. Uh, we can compute the absorbed dose at the voxel level if we wish. But is it relevant to do it? Well, if we're doing the voxel-based calculation, it means that we assume that the activity is also known with a good accuracy at the voxel level. And is that the case? What about partial volume effect correction at the voxel level? Well, it's just one point to consider. What about registration of different time points at a voxel level? So that voxel-based approach may be restricted to selective internal radiotherapy because we only have one imaging time point. And that's, well, you know, so-called controversy 
uh, in medical physics or between Carlo Chiesa and myself, uh, where Carlo Chiesa was defending voxel data symmetry and I was defending uh, that is not ready yet, um, even though I would gladly change my opinion if I, I would enjoy being proven wrong. Another thing to discuss versus uh, organ versus voxel approaches. Uh, we've been discussing in the previous lecture of the reference models, and these are the adult male and female proposed in ICRP 110. Uh, you've got the special sampling that was used to define these models, and you can see that it's not the same for the male and the female model. So the male model has got uh, eight millimeter thick slices, whereas the woman has got about five millimeters uh, thickness slices. So it means that somehow the accuracy with which the organs, especially true with wall organs like a stoma, a stomach, like intestine or bladder, obviously, uh, are defined may vary between men and women, and it's just not uh, realistic enough. So uh, by using voxel only in that context, uh, it may lead to approximation in uh, absorbed dose delivered in wall, uh, in wall organs. Which is why the ICRP has recently introduced uh, multi-scale dosimetry, I mean, at least models that are adult mesh type uh, models uh, and so it means that you can refine the geometry definition if you wish. For example, with hollow organs, which I just mentioned, with uh, the eye lens that are very small, so obviously much smaller than most voxel sampling that have been established so far. Uh, but then obviously to do the absorbed dose calculation in that context requires implementing codes and Monte Carlo codes that are able to understand and use mesh, which is possible but I'm just saying it's not trivial. As a conclusion, patient-specific dosimetry is feasible and it's actually done in more and more clinical centers. Uh, there's a huge literature in quantitative imaging in absorbed dose calculation, meaning that the methodology is there. Uh, then patient-specific dosimetry require all the steps to be patient-specific and the clinical endpoint is going to be what conditions the approach that needs to be implemented. And that will be seen and discussed in the next lecture. So this was the third of a series of five lectures on radiopharmaceutical dosimetry that were prepared under the IAEA Tech Cooperation Program uh, with the project Paul 9025. Thank you.